All right, morning. Uh, today, uh, this talk's gonna be on fuzzing basics or how to break software. A um, little bit about me, uh, I'm Scott or Grid as uh, the case may be, whichever I'll answer to most anything, really. Um, first and foremost, I'm a future husband. My uh, fiance's here. Uh, thanks for putting up with me, by the way. Um, I'm an avid scuba diver, so if you know any good dive spots around, hit me up. Um, semi, well, sort of professional hacker, I guess, but uh, my main, um, I guess, work is uh, I'm a lead software developer and do some security on the side at Company X. My employer asked me not to divulge where I work, so I guess for two reasons. One, kind of a disclaimer for them, and two, I can speak a little more freely because nobody knows where I work, hopefully. Um, so uh, agenda, why fuzz, uh, fuzzing methods, I'll go through some of those, some types of fuzzing, uh, some fuzzing software that I use and have had some success with. Uh, I have several examples and samples and they're posted on GitHub at the link there. I'll have that link in the uh, questions and comments slide at the very end uh, so uh, you can uh, get that. Uh, some tips and tricks that I've learned and were helpful for me and uh, Got some time for questions and comments if you have any. Uh, so first of all, I guess, why fuzz? Well, you don't want to be this guy uh, where you test your code in production. But uh, it's uh, personally, I think it's kind of fun to break software. Uh, but one of the main reasons why I guess we as folks who are attending uh, this conference is uh, as hackers is to find exploitable bugs, which you know really are really fun. Uh, I've personally only written a couple of simple exploits uh, so far, but uh, definitely want to do more. Um, in terms of fuzzing, it really provides you, I feel, with more thorough testing with input that users and uh, often programmers really don't consider. A lot of times, you know, you may have a QA person that goes through a series of test cases, but they may not consider stuff like, okay, well, what happens if we put in a bunch of spaces or a bunch of special characters or even throw nulls into a field? Uh, so, like I said, it provides more thorough testing, which helps increase your the quality of your software. Uh, if you're a software vendor, if you work for a, uh, a place that sells software, you know, I think fuzzing personally is of crucial importance. But uh, for those of us who use software and work in IT departments, it really helps hold your vendors accountable for poorly written and poorly tested code. Uh, I've embarrassed a couple of vendors uh, pretty badly, which honestly was kind of fun, uh, but uh, that did help bring the quality of their software up so it could handle weird cases a little better. Uh, Fuzzing methods, really, I think there's, you could argue that there's more, but I basically kind of broke it down into three categories. Manual fuzzing, where you just put stuff in yourself, whether it's a, uh, a Windows Forms program, a web application. Uh, I work mostly in the .NET realm, so that's where most of my fuzzing experience is from. Uh, but uh, basically, these three methods, I think, are the the ones that I see that are of a more general sense. Uh, manual inputting stuff yourself, as I said. Uh, automated, uh, using some fuzzing software or writing your own fuzzer, and I'll be going through uh, some of the fuzzing software that I've used here in a bit. And uh, wireless fuzzing, uh, MDK3 and Kali Linux uh, can be kind of fun. Uh, if anybody's ever messed with it, it will do all sorts of things in terms of uh, broadcasting packets uh, so you can really throw your access points into a tizzy uh, with it. Uh, but uh, I have found it uh, useful in some occasions, although I haven't done a whole lot of wireless fuzzing. Uh, types of fuzzing, uh, local and remote really are the ones that I deal with, local being where you've got the fuzzing software and your target installed on the same machine, which as far as I can tell and in my experience, you have to do this pretty much for exploit development because you've got to be able to 
run a debugger and stuff to see what's going on behind the scenes when you do get a crash. Uh, and it gives you full control over your environment. You can reboot when you want to. You can restart, whatever. Uh, remote uh, being fuzzing something that's installed elsewhere, like a web application, FTP uh, piece of software, or something that is going to uh, give and receive packets. It's a bit more restricted in terms of control, but that's kind of moot if you can get to the server because you can restart stuff if you need to restart crash services or whatever. Uh, the one caveat that I've found in doing remote fuzzing, specifically with web applications, and hopefully I won't tromp too hard over a talk that's going to be going on later today with hacking web applications, is that uh, network hardware and software, routers, switches, firewalls, and such, uh, sitting between you and the target can be problematic. Uh, I've run into a couple of instances where somebody has a web application firewall or whatever uh, up and you might start out sending uh, TCP traffic that's got your fuzz string in it but by the time it gets to the target it's either garbled or dropped altogether and that's because there was some system sitting in between that uh, monkeyed with your traffic so that's something that you got to kind of keep in mind when uh, doing uh, fuzzing of remote applications. Uh, in terms of fuzzing software, really anything that allows interaction with a target can be considered a fuzzer. Uh, I primarily work on the Windows platform uh, in terms of development and uh, security related stuff. Uh, and on Windows, I've used only Burp Suite a little bit. I usually use it through Kali Linux. Uh, but uh, Peach Fuzzer, uh, anybody use Peach Fuzzer? Show of hands? Okay. Uh, Peach Fuzzer is a uh, cross-platform application. I'll be going into a little bit more of it uh, in a bit, but uh, it's, uh, it runs on uh, both uh, Windows, Linux, and I think it runs on Mac OS too. I've never uh, tried to run it on Mac myself, but uh, it's a pretty good little tool. Uh, in terms of Kali Linux, that's what I use primarily for uh, fuzzing uh, and the tools here, Burp Suite, all of that, uh, all of those with the exception of Peach Fuzzer, they're all bundled into uh, Kali Linux, so that's nice because you don't have to do a whole lot of extra, uh, extra work to get the tools, they're already there. Uh, the Peach Fuzzer on Windows, like I said, I've done most of, most of my work uh, with Peach Fuzzer on the Windows platform. Uh, the uh, top link that you see there uh, is the main site where you can uh, grab it and install it. They've got really good directions on installing it. Uh, the uh, Peach Pits, which is what uh, the Peach Fuzzer refers to as the fuzz definitions, are done in XML, so having a good XML editor is helpful. You can do it in Notepad, uh, and I have for uh, simpler Peach Pits, but uh, for more complex stuff, like if you were writing a peach pit to fuzz a um, web application, for instance, and you were defining the HTTP get or the HTTP post, having a good XML editor will save you some time and headaches. Uh, there are some free peach pits available on the internet and uh, at the uh, peach fuzzer site, I think it's forums.peachfuzzer.com, uh, there's a uh, specific uh, area of the forums that uh, folks will contribute peach pits to. Uh, I've dropped a few out there, uh, so uh, you can check those out if you like. I've also got the samples here uh, and on uh, GitHub. But uh, the one good thing about Peach Fuzzer is it gives you really good feedback for reproducing crashes and login inflow useful for exploit development. Uh, unlike some of the Kali Linux tools where it's more helpful to run a packet capture when you're doing fuzzing on Peach Fuzzer, you really don't have to do that. It will log all this stuff for you whenever a crash occurs, and I've got some examples of uh, that sort of thing coming up, but uh, it's really good for that. Uh, I definitely recommend that you go through the tutorials uh, at the link that you see there on the screen. Uh, those will really help you understand the ins and outs of uh, peach fuzzer uh, and that bottom link uh, a uh, very generous soul posted some fuzzing for newbies which um, 
I found extremely helpful just to kind of get my brain juices flowing on, oh, okay, this, I didn't think about using this sort of thing. It's a, this post specifically as a series of links, uh, both off-site and uh, on uh, the Peach Fuzzer site on um, kind of getting your arms around uh, fuzzing in general. There's some uh, off-site links to tutorials, so it's a, it's a really good link. I definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, there are some gotchas with the peach fuzzer. Uh, I found a couple of small bugs uh, near the end of August, and about a month later, the uh, peach fuzzer uh, developer, oh, uh, Mike Eddington, that's his name, uh, said, okay, well, these aren't a big deal. We're working on our commercial product. Uh, peach fuzzer has kind of two flavors. There's a community edition, which is the free one, the one I use, and then there's uh, the I think they call it Peach Professional, that uh, they're working on uh, trying to keep it maintained and uh, up to date. So the response that I got from him said, well, okay, we'll get to it, but it's uh, not really that big a deal, they didn't feel. So, uh, and it's honestly just two misspellings. Some, one of the programmers, I'm sure, just left out an I, and two of the uh, mutators, uh, the size data variance mutator and the size variance mutator, he just left an eye out. So if you want to exclude those, then you'll have to misspell them uh, as I've listed there on the screen so they will exclude properly. And I'll have some uh, peach example definitions here and like I said, they're on my GitHub area uh, to uh, show you that. Uh, not all the samples in uh, the Peach Fuzzer samples directory, when you install it, work out of the box. You've got to tweak them a little bit, and uh, that's where going through the tutorials on the Peach Fuzzer website can help. Um, because they're XML, and I'll be honest, I am not an XML guru, uh, the Peach Pits can be difficult to write and debug, but there's some ways that you can, um, or there's some tricks with the Peach Fuzzer uh, that you can use to help kind of ease that burden. There's some validation and stuff that it will do that will uh, kind of ease your pain a bit. Uh, whoa. Uh, the um, uh, one thing, and uh, you'll uh, see this if you uh, go through any fuzzing of wave files, this specific mutator uh, array numerical edge cases Every time I've tried to run it on Windows, when I've tried to fuzz wave files, uh, it just causes Windows to just crap out and go crazy. Uh, the hard drive light will just stick on, and whenever I can get Task Manager up, it's just pegged at 100%, so it just really craps Windows out, despite the fact that it really doesn't crash the uh, wave file player that I was testing. Uh, it just totally whacks Windows, so. Uh, that one you might want to exclude in some instances. Uh, but uh, some tips for running Peach Fuzzer that I have found, when you just run Peach at the command line, now this is on Windows, uh, with no parameters, it'll give you a list of options that it supports. Uh, Peach minus T will validate your Peach Pit, uh, not only for well-formed XML, but also if you're uh, missing something that Peach requires, like part of a data model or a state model, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, Peach minus one will sample run your Peach pit. It won't apply any of what Peach refers to as mutators, uh, different ways of twisting your input data to cause crashes. Uh, but it'll just run your uh, target fuzz program as normal. So if you've got something that uh, develops a or outputs a text file, for instance, if you run peach minus one uh, and you're followed by your peach pit against it, then it will just run the target program as normal. So you can validate that, you know, hey, peach ran my program. I got the output that I would expect if I were running my program as normal. Uh, peach minus C with your uh, pit.xml file will give you a count of the test iterations before starting. And if you uh, especially if you don't do any mutator exclusions, this can uh, produce uh, a whole bunch of test iterations, which is what you want, but uh, you may want to be prepared, you know, like to kick it off and just go get a coffee or 10 or uh, what have you. Uh, generally, when you run 
peach fuzzer. Um, it will generate, with no exclusions, it will generate several thousand, sometimes tens of thousands, or even a couple hundred thousand test cases. So it's going to run for a while. Um, uh, now that kind of brings me to an interesting thing that uh, peach fuzzer will do. Uh, the peach minus p command with you can uh, split the fuzzing run up if you have multiple machines with the peach fuzzer software installed. Uh, it's not particularly fancy, but it will do the job. It doesn't do any networking, as I said there, but uh, it just simply divides the number of test iterations by the number of machines. So if you've got 30,000 test iterations running on three machines, then it will break down the iterations as you see there with the first machine running the first 10,000, the second machine running the middle chunk, and then the last machine running the final chunk. So it will, um, it will definitely let you complete your fuzzing run faster, um, but, uh, and it won't miss any test cases. Uh, but there may be instances where running in parallel won't give you full coverage. And I'm kind of guessing at that. I haven't done a whole lot of parallel fuzzing running with Peach, but uh, uh, I have seen some crashes that were not reproducible on a parallel fuzzing run that were if I ran all of the test iterations on the same machine. So you can kind of uh, play around with that. Uh, here's a peach pit from the online tutorial at the Peach Fuzzer website. And basically, uh, what it's broken into chunks. The data model uh, chunk there basically describes the data that you're going to fuzz. In this instance, this was uh, fuzzing a, um, uh, what was it, a uh, picture file. So uh, I defined the, the data model is defined as a blob. The state model recreates the logic that Peach needs to know in order to fuzz properly. So the, uh, the state name, just initial, hey, this is our only state. This is the only one we're going to run. We're going to write out the fuzzed uh, PNG file. Uh, and the, the folder, we're going to read our sample files uh, from this area. So they'll be read in from PNG test files, everything in there with a PNG extension. They'll be twisted and turned by the fuzzer, and then output as a, I think I call it, well, you'll see it here in a minute, a fuzz.png. The fu that, that is what will be fed into, in this case, the MS Paint program. Uh, so this is what uh, the process of doing that is controlled here in the state model. Uh, the agent uh, basically is a process that tells Peach uh, the platform that it's running on, as well as platform-specific um, monitors, which a monitor is some action that Peach takes, and an agent wraps up monitors. So this, I named this monitor class Windows Debugger, and these parameters here are specific Peach uh, commands that can be run. Uh, for instance, there's the command line that I'm calling in order to do the fuzzing. Oops, let me back up. Uh, the debug path for the Windows Debugger Peach does not come with the Windows debugging tools. You have to get those, uh, but there's a link on the, uh, on the peachfuzzer.com website that has uh, links to Microsoft's website in order to download the uh, debugging tools. Uh, start on call and CPU kill, uh, those are optional parameters, uh, but the way in going through the tutorial, they use the, uh, the start on call and CPU kill commands, which start on call basically says, okay, don't start a debugging session until I actually call, in this case, the uh, MS Paint program and CPU kill. Uh, I believe that uh, stops the fuzzing run if the CPU hits 100% for a certain amount of time. And uh, not only am I, wa I'm also watching the heap here, uh, watching the heap specifically for this executable, and I've got my win debug path here. Uh, 
I don't know if it's a bug in peach fuzzer, but uh, you're not supposed to need to specify the path to the Windows debugger, uh, but unless I put it in there, I've never had it work. Uh, when I try to validate the peach pit, it says uh, peach comes back when they're saying, hey, we can't find the Windows debugging tool. So I have, uh, at least on Windows, I've always specified the uh, debug path. And then the last part of this peach pit is the test, which basically the test node wraps everything up and tells Peach what to do uh, based on the info that you provided in the earlier sections. The publisher uh, here in this case is saying, okay, I want to, I'm out, I'm working with a file, so I have to specify the specific file that uh, in this case that I'm using to fuzz. So it's called fuzz.png. Uh, that's generated, as I said earlier, when the uh, Peach takes the raw file from the directory that I told it to look in. It twists it with its mutator and then it writes it to the fuzz.png file and then opens it up in MS Paint and that's how an iteration of fuzzing this works. Uh, the strategy class, you don't have to specify that. Uh, I was playing around with it and decided to just tell it random. Random meaning it's going to jump around in the various mutators that Peach is going to try. Uh, that may give you uh, more crashes or better crashes than just running sequentially from top to bottom. Uh, and the logger class there at the bottom uh, tells Peach, okay, when I get a crash or I'm updating the status to let the user know, in this case us, what iteration am I on, it's uh, writing that to the uh, logs directory, which a logs, if it doesn't exist, the logs directory will be created as a subdirectory from wherever you're running Peach. So if you've installed Peach in the Peach Fuzzer directory, then there'll be a logs created under that with all of the information in there about the fuzzing run. Uh, have a Peach bit here to uh, fuzz a command line program, which takes one argument, and this one I created. Uh, based on my need for a, um, uh, there was a uh, DOS-based program that uh, ran as an automated job uh, at my work, and I decided, well, let me see how this thing holds up under Peach Fuzzer. So with some help from uh, uh, some of the folks on the Peach Fuzzer forums, I uh, created this, and uh, I'll go through this a little more quickly, but uh, basically, the data model in this case has two parts to it. The program, the name of the program, extract.exe that I'm fuzzing, and the parameter, which in this case, uh, this extractor uh, pulls some stuff out of a database and then writes it to a directory. Now, I didn't want to fuzz the extract program itself, I just wanted to give it a malformed directory parameter. Uh, so I'll, that's the reason the program itself, this extract.exe has a, once you specify the program, it needs a space for a delimiter and then the parameter. So it may be a little hard to see, but there is a space right after the .exe here. So like I said, I'm trying to fuzz the parameter itself, not the extract program directly. So if you wanted to, and I put these put this block of comments in here, if you wanted to fuzz a command line program which has more than one parameter, you would just need to specify additional data model nodes with the parameters that you uh, need there. And, oops, I jumped ahead. The uh, state model in this case uh, and I commented this honestly as much for my benefit as anyone who might want this, uh, this peach pit, so I could keep it in mind and remember it. Um, the state model, model writes a batch file which peach then calls, uh, and you'll see it in the next screen, but uh, the first run, whether you're running in a, te uh, in a, uh, a test with a peach minus one or not, will always be the uh, program, space, and then the parameter, so it will run as normal. Uh, the subsequent runs will have uh, the program and then whatever the fuzz data is. 
so, uh, and just like with the data model, the state model will have, if you wanted to add additional uh, parameters, if you had a command line program that took two, three, four parameters, you would just add them as different nodes, uh, action nodes, oops, under the, uh, under the state node, uh, second parameter, third parameter, and so on. Uh, this close here specifically says, okay, after you've written the batch file, stop, make the fuzzing run before you blow the batch file away and recreate it with your next extract.exe and then the fuzz string. So that, in this case, that gives me a clean run where I've only got one fuzz string at a time in the batch file. Uh, the agent is uh, fairly similar to the previous one. I'm running this on Windows, so I called it the Windows Debugger. Uh, I'm specifying the command line uh, to the batch file that Peach is creating, which I, ref which I called it just call program.bat. Uh, so I keep doing that. Uh, the, uh, there's the win debug path, the path to the Windows Debugger. Uh, the start on call in this case is saying, hey, I want to do the run, I want to run the program, which is specified in the state model earlier. Um, the, these two parameters I kind of played around with because the extract.exe program can be long running. So you may need the wait for exit on call and wait for exit timeout parameters. Uh, basically, the first one says, hey, don't stop until the program's finished. Oh, excuse me, I got that backwards. The wait for exit on call says, okay, I want to hold on before I close and stop the creation of the call program.bat, which holds my call. And the wait for exit on timeout says, okay, Peach, don't cut this program off, let it run to completion, and see if it crashes. Uh, you, like I said, you might need those for long-running programs. Uh, I've not done enough with Peach Fuzzer yet to know if that's necessary in all cases, but uh, I left them in there kind of as a memory jog for myself. Uh, as before, I'm watching the heap to see if there are any crashes there. Uh, Peach has this interesting little uh, feature called a pop-up watcher. So in this case, when the extract program, if, uh, if it crashes and it's not a fatal crash, rather than sit there and having to click the close on those uh, windows has encountered an error and the program's closing, Peach will close those automatically if you can get the name of what's in the title bar on the window. So when I ran this and it's going along and it's churning and then it crashes but it's not a fatal crash or it's not an exploitable crash uh, or if it's a crash that Peach can't reproduce, uh, rather than just having like 50, 60 or more of those windows there, the pop-up watcher will close them as they come up so you don't have a whole lot of clutter on your screen. Uh, and the test, just like before, it wraps up all of the other nodes that you have created. The extract, ex, excuse me, exclude XPath here uh, specifically says, hey, I don't want to mess with the extract.exe name. Uh, leave that alone. Uh, so that's the reason for this node here. The, uh, in this case, I was doing a strategy of sequential. I wanted to run through all of the test cases from top to bottom. Um, my publisher in this case calls the uh, call program dot bat the created one the batch program that peach will create uh, I decided to be a little different and uh, log it specifically to a different directory I was running the peach command out of a different uh, install location in this case and here's the uh, exclude node for the mutators these are the uh, mutators that I specifically didn't want to run uh, this makes for a shorter fuzzing run, but maybe not as complete a fuzzing run. So you can, if you don't use this exclude 
this mutators mode exclude. By default, Peach will run every one of the mutators. So you may want to, you may want to exclude certain mutators uh, in some circumstances. Uh, and here at the bottom, uh, note the misspellings here size data varnance mutator and size varnance mutator. If I'd, that's the bugs that I mentioned earlier. If I had left those spelled correctly, then Peach wouldn't have excluded them. In terms of logging, and I'm going to jump out to, uh, well, logging. Uh, when Peach logs items, uh, it creates a, uh, it creates a directory under the logs directory with the pit name, the test, if you have multiple tests defined in a pit, and then a date timestamp. I put the errors on here just to uh, have, a, uh, have an easier way to find what I was looking for. But uh, if you were to get a reproducible crash, you would see something like this. The status.txt file is always there, and it tells you uh, how far you're into a fuzzing run. Uh, so in this case, Peach found a fault at this iteration, so it tried to rerun it to see if it was reproducible, and it was. <coughs> so within that directory, whoops, uh, there's a false, and then it says, hey, it, it ran it, I deemed it exploitable, uh, so it gave me a couple of uh, memory addresses. Oops. And this was the iteration that the uh, reproducible crash happened on. Initial holds the, uh, the same information that you see here, but the first pass of it, the first iteration that caused the crash. The second and the one that Peach deemed exploitable is here. So in, I was fuzzing the extract program, so action one output is the non-fuzzable uh, part of the fuzzing run that I wanted to do, which means, hey, don't mess with the extract.exe. I want to leave that alone. The action two is more interesting because it tells you the specific string that caused the crash. So you can reproduce it if you want to uh, write up some uh, Python or Perl or what have you to reproduce the crash. And then we've got a stack trace here that the uh, Windows debugging tools logged. I think it's at the bottom uh, that uh, note the uh, info here, the user mode write access violations that are not near, near null are exploitable. I haven't tried to write an exploit for this particular program. Honestly, I ran this on a 64-bit machine, so this one may be beyond my current level of skill, but uh, the information here needed to reproduce the crash as well as to uh, write up an exploit uh, should be all that you need in order to get started. This is the uh, um, whoops, oh, the debug, excuse me, the uh, debug uh, stuff logged by the Windows debugger. And you can see here at the bottom it says uh, the same thing in the stack trace that. Uh, user mode write access violations that are not near null are exploitable. So uh, that's what a Peach consider, or this is what you'll see when you see a reproducible crash that Peach deems exploitable. If it's a false positive or something that Peach could not run through twice, it will say, hey, I couldn't reproduce it, and you'll see something like this, a, uh, a status which has only one crash in it, and within the non-reproducible, it may say unknown, it may say something else, uh, but within that directory, uh, you'll see the iteration where the crash happened, um, the action one, in this case, the extract program that was fuzzing, action two, the specific parameter that caused the crash, and then uh, just a uh, debugger description that said, hey, this was the first time I had this happen, but I couldn't get it to happen again, so I'm going to assume it's not reproducible, it's not exploitable, and I'm just going to go to the next iteration. So that's kind of a run-through of what uh, you could see in terms of logging by Peach Fuzzer. It's, it's pretty decent as far as, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, 
Burp Suite, uh, it's not really a fuzzer per se. Has anybody used Burp Suite? Okay. Um, but uh, I like the uh, repeater for manual fuzzing. Um, I do a lot of work with web application testing, so uh, I like Burp Suite for uh, manual testing of uh, web applications. But the decoder and comparer uh, thing, uh, windows in Burp Suite are pretty handy as well. And this is a, uh, oh, that came out terrible. Uh, a uh, screenshot of uh, the uh, burp suite uh, repeater function and I've got the uh, areas in red rectangle which specify uh, where specifically I was wanting to fuzz in this case uh, in this case I was wanting to fuzz the parameter pass to that image handler dot as hx um, item and the uh, I was wanting to fuzz the cookie value instead or excuse me the cookie value also so I just put fuzz data in there uh, to kind of give myself a little reminder hey this is where I want to change something uh, so Kali Linux going to the dark side a little bit uh, there's a number of tools there um, bed I think it stands for brute force exploit detector but I'm honestly not sure uh, it's a network protocol fuzzer. It handles uh, those you see there on the screen as well as a few others. Uh, I use it mostly for HTTP, but I've used it for FTP as well. Uh, use a set list of strings for fuzzing so it doesn't do mutation. But it's written in Perl, so you can uh, add your own strings by uh, just changing the code. It's not that big a deal. Uh, it's a good general use fuzzer. You kind of fire and forget it. Uh, but as with a lot of tools in Kali Linux, I'll start a packet capture before running it so I can see the specific value that caused a crash if one occurs. Uh, this is a uh, copy and paste from the bed code uh, with the specific strings in it. Uh, you can see they have the bed authors broke it down into overflow strings, format strings, and so forth. So bed will cycle through all of these test cases when you kick it off. Uh, Duna, uh, it's basically version two of BED. Uh, uses a little better list of uh, preset strings. Uh, it's also written in Perl, so you can hack it up pretty easy. Uh, another fire and forget fuzzer. And uh, these are the uh, strings that uh, it uses. As you can see, there are a few more in there. Like I said, you know, you can, uh, it's Perl code, so you can uh, add your own with no big deal. Um, dot dot pwn, uh, it's good for uh, finding directory traversal stuff, but uh, when I've used it, I've had to edit the uh, traversal engine uh, to look for specific target files that I was seeking. Also Perl, so it's uh, pretty understandable and easy to modify. Um, I've found dot dot pwn most useful after I've done a decent amount of reconnaissance to learn the machine well because the more specific you can tell dot dot pwn hey this is a windows box this is a unix box uh, it will do a better job and it'll run a little quicker because it won't have to make assumptions on the target that it's running on uh, and that's why i mentioned there if you're running it uh, use the minus e and minus x parameters to uh, really get you uh, get you a good run through uh, to see if there's a directory traversal problem on the box you're testing. Um, don't forget the uh, minus M to switch HTTP methods between get and post if you're doing it on a uh, web server because sometimes the uh, get parameters uh, or the post parameters may not be uh, sanitized as thoroughly as they should be. Uh, this is a screenshot of the dot dot pwn uh, code with the specific uh, files that it looks for by default in Windows and Unix and then it was the extra file section that I edited uh, giving the specific path where I thought the file was located the target file I was located in there and then I used the minus E parameter so it would look for that specifically. Uh, some uh, Metasploit fuzzer modules um, has anybody used any of the fuzzer modules in Metasploit? Okay, there I um, there's several of them there. Um, 
uh, you can see there I've got the path to the specific uh, folder if you're not sure of it, or you can just do a search fuzzer within the MSF console. Uh, the SMB and HTTP fuzzers I've found to uh, be pretty good at crashing things. Uh, not all the modules support the threads parameter, but if it does, bump it up. It'll help your fuzzing run finish a little faster. Uh, the Metasploit fuzzer modules uh, give you pretty good feedback on what caused the crash. It'll give you the string that caused the crash specifically, but just to be safe, I still run a packet capture when I'm using those. Um, the uh, fuzzer.rb uh, is will give you the details on how the fuzz strings are created, and I'm no Ruby expert by any means. I've only slung a few lines of Ruby code, but uh, it was good for me in uh, how to learning how to customize my own fuzzers because there were some not only some good fuzz strings in there but also some good ideas on warping strings that would uh, cause interesting behavior or crashes so uh, definitely check out that fuzzer.rb uh, ruby code um, if uh, you find yourself kind of stuck and saying well i can't get a crash but i just feel like this thing will crash the uh, there's some good uh, good stuff there that will uh, maybe kind of get your brain juices flowing. Uh, the TDS login corrupt and TDS login username are good for fuzzing SQL Server. I haven't done a whole lot of fuzzing SQL Server, but when I was looking at the Ruby code, um, it's a smidgen out of date. I think it the packets that these two fuzzers uh, create are, well, actually a little more than that, a lot out of date. It, uh, it's specifically written for SQL Server 2000. Uh, so after a bit of thumbing through the internet, I found a couple links on Microsoft's website that define the TDS protocol. Uh, and that second link has the TDS versions used in SQL Server. So you can tweak the Ruby code a bit to uh, target uh, more specifically, more modern versions of SQL Server. The, um, those HTTP fuzzers that I have mentioned there, they're good, I've had I've gotten some crashes with those along with the SMB2 negotiate corrupt um, fuzzer. So uh, yeah, Metasploit has some good fuzzing modules in it. Uh, there are fuzzers in Nmap, uh, and I actually didn't uh, find that out until I was just nosing through the uh, uh, Nmap scripts direction. It's like, oh, holy crap, there's fuzzers there. So maybe I ought to check them out. Uh, the uh, DNS fuzz, I haven't used that one yet. Uh, the HTTP PHP self.xss, I think that's fairly new. I don't remember that uh, showing up before the last, or maybe next to last update the uh, Kali Linux guys did. Uh, the HTTP form fuzzer has been there for a while, and I've found that helpful. It's not quite as good as producing crashes as uh, the uh, Metasploit modules, but it's pretty decent. Uh, uh, Spike uh, is another fuzzer. Uh, I've found it kind of tough to use because I'm not a big C guy, uh, even though I've written C Sharp for a while. Uh, C is still a little arcane to me, but there's a really good, and I mean really good, tutorial on Spike at that uh, link. Uh, Stephen Bradshaw, I think, does, I think is the guy's name, and he really breaks down these difficult to you or difficult for me to get uh, spike concepts into understandable language. So if you're interested in learning spike, uh, definitely check that tutorial out. Uh, Kali comes with a number of pre-built spikes, uh, but uh, I've always had to hack around on them a little bit. Uh, their spike basically has two commands, a generic send TCP and a generic UDP, which uh, send those packets respectively. Uh, the documentation on spike, well, I mean, let's just be honest, it stinks. But uh, the uh, tutorial really helped me more than anything else. Uh, the tutorial at the InfoSec Institute resource uh, really helped me more than anything else to get a handle on Spike. Um, to find the fuzz strings, it's not necessarily easy. I had to do a fair amount of gripping to uh, get it, but the spike.c code in the init fuzz ints uh, area, then you look for fuzz strings, you'll see the fuzz strings that Spike uses. But, uh, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I've been able to find, the default Kali Linux install doesn't come with the spike source. You have to find it. And after uh, a lot of hunting, 
I found this fuzzing.org uh, website with a link that had spike file that had the spike source in it. So I grabbed it and stuck it on my Kali Linux box so I could refer to it. Like I said, I'm no C expert, but uh, having the source has been helpful to see what fuzz string spike uses. So I've got some sample spikes here uh, for fuzzing an HTTP GET. Uh, basically, and I've got it well commented here, the, uh, I used uh, Burp Suite to intercept the HTTP GET and then uh, got a spike built from it. The S string basically is a constant. Uh, the S string variable is the specific thing that you want to fuzz. So for the first pass, the uh, HTTP GET will have the variable, oops, the variable that you see here, which is just a regular user agent string. The subsequent passes will have the fuzz strings inserted by Spike. Uh, so when you kick off a fuzzing run with Spike, it's probably going to run for a while. Uh, so with a lot of the other Kali Linux tools, you want to start a packet capture before that so you can see the specific fuzz string that caused your crash. Uh, got another spike here for fuzzing HTTP GET. In this case, I was fuzzing a variable to the image handler uh, dot ashx page. So there's my, this will be passed as normal, a constant, and then the first time through it'll pass with this variable and then subsequent times uh, it will insert the fuzz string. The, uh, I've got a carriage return line feed here about four lines down that makes sure that the get request is properly formed. And another uh, spike for uh, fuzzing an HTTP get. Uh, in this case I was uh, fuzzing the web resource dot axd. Uh, I guess the best word to describe it is the, uh, it's an internal Microsoft thing if you're running uh, a .NET web application. Uh, let's see, uh, spike for fuzzing HTTP post. Uh, it's pretty similar to the gets. The difference is near the bottom and uh, the Uh, Stephen Bradshaw's um, primer on Spike at the link earlier, uh, I don't think goes into real good detail on this, so I had to kind of figure this out. Uh, these, this block size string, block start and block end, are there so that the content length of the post will be calculated correctly. Uh, if not, uh, your um, in this case, I was fuzzing against something running on IIS. It's just going to drop the uh, post request, so you need to have that content length properly calculated. And then that's what the uh, block size uh, string and the block start and block end. So when you've got a block start and a block end, it will calculate everything that's wrapped within that and then throw it into the content length. So I'm defining, in this case, a five-digit long content length there in the block size string. And then the block start and block end, like I said, will spike will calculate that properly and throw it in before it uh, dumps the uh, HTTP post request on the wire. Uh, the Peach Fuzzer on Kali Linux, I've only run it a little bit. Uh, like I said, I've mostly run it on Windows, so I don't have as much uh, familiarity with it. But uh, it's basically the same as uh, on Windows, the only difference is it needs the mono packages. The, uh, I guess it's open source version of the .NET framework. Uh, if you're on a Ubuntu or a Debian distro, you can just do an app get install mono complete. The directions on uh, the peachfuzzer.com website will walk you through that as well. Uh, some general tips and tricks. Uh, mess around with your target program first before fuzzing it. You don't have to know it inside and out, but uh, the better you understand how it works properly, you can then tailor your fuzzing to break it. Um, so you can kind of, when you know how it works or get an understanding of how it works correctly, then you can ask yourself the question, you know, what are the best or worst inputs I can pass to it that will cause damage? Uh, a lot of programmers, and I'm including myself in this category, uh, 
code for certain types of bad input. Uh, but it's almost impossible to catch all instances. Programmers like to blacklist stuff rather than whitelist. Uh, but try mixing up special characters and spaces, uh, carriage returns and line feeds stuff. Uh, I just threw an example up there uh, of a uh, fuzz string that I've actually uh, gotten some programs to crash just with that specific text you see there on the screen. Um, uh, like I said, spaces, special characters, format strings, uh, there's some uh, .NET platform examples. Those are specific to C Sharp. Uh, but uh, if you're fuzzing a VB.NET web application, uh, you can do a little looking on uh, Microsoft's website to see the format strings that they use. Opinion seems to be varied on whether format string attacks are possible with the .NET platform. I'm going under the assumption that they are. I just haven't found the right one yet. Uh, so I always insert some stuff, uh, format string like when I'm fuzzing. Um, uh, virtual, mach uh, via virtual machine software is really good. It lowers your uh, total cost of doing fuzzing. Uh, Oracle VirtualBox or VMware is good, whichever you prefer. Uh, that goes for spare hardware, wireless access points. Uh, fuzzing is disruptive by nature, so you got to be prepared to reboot your target. Um, and if you're doing it live, of course, make sure you let the appropriate folks know about it, your network admins, programmers, and stuff, because uh, especially if you've got some security people who are on the ball, like they should be watching the logs, then they start seeing weird traffic. They should get a little nervous. Uh, the dev.modern.ie has some free time-limited uh, virtual machines that are good for fuzzing targets. Uh, Vulnhub.com has some challenges. Uh, via downloadable virtual machines. Not fuzzing specific, but uh, you can use them to fuzz on. And uh, exploitdb.com has some good write-ups on, uh, uh, on fuzzing there. I've read through those papers a couple times just to kind of refresh my memory. Um, start with a short fuzzing run at first to make sure everything's good. Uh, like I said, if you're using it on a Windows platform, Peach, uh, We'll do a, uh, just a test run or just uh, run for a few iterations to make sure everything is good. Um, do it, just check it now and then, even with automated fuzzing. Um, for Windows, you want to simulate your production environment as closely as possible. Um, antivirus, anti-malware software, uh, and including Microsoft Emet, um, they may give you problems depending on how paranoid they are. Uh, they may crash or throw up a message saying, hey, this is an attack or whatever. Um, you may want that and you may not. Depends on, you know, your specific circumstances. Um, with Peach, uh, it will run your target out of memory. Uh, after a while, the, your target will just really start to bog down and slow down, so I guess be prepared for that. Um, Control-Alt-Delete is your friend, the good old three-finger salute on Windows that we all know and love. Uh, for Kali Linux, uh, I usually start with more general use fuzzers like Bed and Duna and then go down uh, the list, dot, dot, pwn or whatever, but it really depends on what I'm fuzzing. Uh, but, and I guess this really, the next one really uh, applies to both Windows and Kali. Check the fuzzing source to make sure that it's sending the fuzz strings that you expect. You might need to customize them based on what you're fuzzing. If you're doing a white box test, for instance, where you know the platform, then you can, uh, if you know you're running uh, a PHP application on uh, Unix, then you can add in specific PHP format strings, for instance. If you know you're running IIS and it's a C Sharp web application, you may want to throw in some C Sharp specific uh, stuff like reserved words or nulls or uh, things like that. Um, but uh, definitely on Kali, I always start a packet capture before beginning a fuzzing run uh, because not all of the tools really give you good feedback. Uh, with a packet capture, you know, you can see exactly where uh, the, exactly what you sent that caused the crash, uh, either Wireshark or TCP dump, whichever you prefer. Um, so, like I said in the beginning, my samples are on uh, that GitHub, uh, as you see there. Grab them, fool around with them. Um, but uh, 
really you want to make puzzing fuzzing excuse me part of your development or QA process it does help uh, but you know like I said there with a smiley face it might drive your programmers nuts which you know that's good for them it doesn't hurt them to uh, get a little stressed every now and then uh, but uh, uh, I'll be around stop and introduce yourself or I may just walk up to you and start talking so uh, be prepared for that uh, and my email address is uh, there at the bottom so uh, hit me up if you have questions any questions comments yeah Mm -hmm. Well, the I and I'll be honest, I haven't done it all that much, but generally when Peach tells me that something's exploitable, the first thing I'm going to try to do is I'll get the stack trace, the original stack trace on one screen and then I'll code up something uh, in Perl or Python or something I can just blow out really quick. Uh, with that exact fuzz string and then I'll see if I get a crash in exactly that same spot. If it does happen then I'll probably run through, I would suggest running through that same uh, proof of concept once, twice, three times even after rebooting the machine to make sure that it crashes in exactly that same spot. If that happens then you're well on your way to writing an exploit because at that point if you can at that point, if you're getting a crash at the same spot with the same string and you see the same uh, registers being overwritten, then you're about halfway there. At that point, it's just about you know making, making some shell code and finding, uh, getting an ops lead or something so you can shim, shim something in. Yes, uh, if and like I said, I'm no expert exploit developer. I've only written a couple, and none of them I've felt confident enough to try to send in to the exploit DB guys. But uh, yeah, DEP will uh, give you heartburn uh, if you're trying to write exploits. And I see somebody out there chuckling, so I guess you've run into that problem. Uh, and uh, ASLR, address space layout randomization, yeah, that'll that'll give you fits too. But uh, what you can do is get a, uh, you can get one of the uh, older VMs off the dev.modern.ie. They've got uh, XP VMs out there where you can turn off, I don't think XP has ASLR on it, but you can turn off depth there and then run your, uh, run your program so you can have something that will give you a little cleaner path toward exploitation. I've never tried to bypass ASLR or depth uh, like I said, I'm very much a newbie on writing exploits, but I know it's possible. I just don't have the skills yet to do it. Any other questions, comments? Okay, that's all for me. Thank you for listening.